Good evening, Trinity family. It's good to be with you and uh, those who may be guests as well joining us online. It's uh, all over the world. So whoever you are, wherever you are, I'm uh, pre-recording this one today. So uh, please um, uh, forgive me for not allowing any uh, on-the-fly questions, but I pray this uh, study will still be a blessing for you. Uh, my grandmother passed away last week, and so today I'm at her uh, funeral, uh, well, visitation today, funeral tomorrow, and so uh, pre-recorded this study for us, uh, kind of a conclusion for our baptism study, um, well, not kind of, but actually a conclusion for our baptism study. I uh, wasn't sure if I was going to take the conclusion, but I, I think it's good to just cap things off, and uh, this is a good a good discussion to have um, going to take um, the, we're, we've been using the, uh, the study guide from the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, uh, the CTCR, Commission on Theology and Church Relations, and we're going to uh, uh, weed through that today. Um, we're going um, uh, to, just to give you a heads up the way the study is going to look, um, just due to my preparation time, sorry about that. I'm going to be putting the, the study guide over here on the, uh, Let's see, that's the left side of the screen, and so uh, we'll be going through that together. I'll try to uh, enlarge as appropriate, um, but, but we're going to just jump right in, and we're going to handle these additional questions about baptism, which are um, part of the conclusion, um, and then we're going to actually conclude with the conclusion for, uh, for this. And so uh, I'll be looking up the verses um, as we go along. Um, in my Bible, there, there will not be uh, scripture passages on the screen, so this is different than we've done in the past, so if you want to grab your Bible uh, to, to follow along with that, that'd be great. Um, otherwise, uh, I'll be reading the text as well so you can hear the words of scripture um, along with the, the content of the questions and whatnot that we have here. So, uh, let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the gift of baptism, and we pray that as we uh, uh, consider it once again this night, you would open our, our eyes, our ears, but most of all, our hearts to, to believe and to receive the gifts that you give us in baptism. Lord, for those who have not been baptized, we pray that you would uh, bring them to the waters. And Lord, help us to be those people that uh, point uh, the world to your gifts. Uh, we pray, Lord, that as uh, we further understand them and discuss them tonight, we would know even greater the treasure that it is and, and be, uh, be your people once again. Uh, bless us in this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so questions that they have here, and um, we've handled a lot of these questions on some level or another, and, and some of them might be new, so that's, uh, uh, or worded differently, which is helpful. So uh, first question that shows up here, and let me see how well I can do on uh, zooming in. Uh, I think I can go sideways. No, I can't go sideways there. We'll figure this out. Um, should have practiced that zooming in before I actually did it. So first question here on the right page, is it acceptable to use different Trinitarian formulas when baptizing? So what does that mean, a Trinitarian formula? A uh, good example right here, uh, some people might say in some churches, I baptize you in the name of the Creator, Redeemer, and Sanctifier. Um, so in some church bodies decide not to use uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit because they don't want to use the gender-specific prone names, uh, titles for God as God's revealed himself. Um, and uh, so the, the study guide answers really well here. While those terms, and, and go figure, the per person who wrote the study guide knew what they were talking about. While those terms and others sometimes may be used, uh, and they might be Trinitarian in their pattern, they're, they're more titles or descriptions of God than they are names of God. Um, Moreover, they could easily lead one to speak in a modalistic manner that denies the three persons. Um, so modalism, as it says in this parenthetical right here, modalism uh, is only one, God is only one person, but, but acts differently or plays three different roles. So, um, so and this is a, a, a heresy that's been in the church for ages, is that God acts in different forms and so that's why we call him father because he created at the beginning and then he showed up as the son but it really wasn't a different person it was the same one and then once the son disappeared out of sight the holy spirit came you could see how reasonably that might make sense and like well let's just explain god that way and we'll start to understand him a little bit better but that's not faithful to the way god reveals himself in scripture or speaks about himself so uh there's there's hints of modalism when we use terms that aren't the titles uh for god so even if the intention is to reference the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, such formulas raise uncertainty, uh, raise unnecessary questions. Um, so that gives us uncertainty, gives us concerns and doubts, 
for the one being baptized by departing from the words given to us by our Lord. When Jesus said, go therefore make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So the most uh, confident we can be is to use the words that Jesus said to use. Um, so as Christ's followers, we're bound to remain with the words that Christ gave us to use. We therefore baptize using those words in which the pastor repeats the very words of Christ in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So um, that's, that's there. Um, just a side note, there are um, some churches that baptize in the name of Jesus. And, and if I uh, understand correctly, as long as that church has a Trinitarian understanding of baptism we, and, and doubt is not large along the lines of, of that, that baptism, we will not re-baptize. But if somebody comes to, t came to church and says, you know, I was baptized at this church and they baptized me in the name of the Creator, Redeemer, and Sanctifier, um, we, we might just say, hey, let's baptize you again with the words that Jesus used. Um, not confident that it needs to happen again, but creating a moment where we can be confident in the words that Jesus gave us to speak, if that makes sense. Uh, so baptism is one of the things that we don't want to have any doubt about. And so that's why we, we do baptismal certificates. That's why we have witnesses. That's why we have church records of baptism so that people can say, you know, I was baptized and this is how it was done. And it was in accord with God's word and promises and institution of baptism. So I don't have to have any doubts that God has made me a member of his family at that time in that place. Next question that comes up here, uh, why are baptisms normally conducted in the church? Um, baptism is normally conducted as a public act as the church gathers in worship. And um, I'll often get questions from, from people saying, you know, we'd like to be baptized, but we haven't been to church in a while, and so we don't really know if we're comfortable showing up on Sunday morning and everybody seeing it. They don't actually maybe say all that, but that's kind of what's going on. And So can you just do it for us and, you know, we'll... we'll do it on after service or or can you do it on like a Saturday or you know maybe sometimes this constraints you know family can't be in town and whatnot and sometimes we'll accommodate those things uh, but usually we will urge and encourage the baptism to take place in a worship service because it is a public ceremony it reminds us that baptism makes us all members of the church the body of Christ it's it's not just an individual relationship with God certainly that is a reality that we want to rejoice in but we are members of the body of Christ as, as God's adopted children. So a person's entry into this new eternal family is a cause for celebration for the whole people of God, not just for the parents and other relatives. Um, so occasionally baptism is done in a private setting for various reasons, and baptism administered in cases of emergency, which we talked about last time, will by necessity take place outside of a regular service. But there's oftentimes a public recognition of baptism that takes place after a, for whatever reason it might be necessary, uh, private baptism has taken place. So let's look at these passages to help us unpack just a little bit more. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, um, it's in the Bible. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12 through 13 says, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. So we have that uh, passage, uh, also 26 and 27. Uh, if one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. That's a, a great picture of reality. We, we want to rejoice together about a, a baptism. This is a good thing that takes place. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. So this uh, baptism in a public worship service is a visual reminder that you are part of something bigger than just you and God or you and your family and God. You are baptized into this confessing uh, reality. These people who believe the same things you believe, receive the same gifts you receive. This is cool. Ephesians 4 verses 4 through 6 tells us, um, There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, through all, and in all. So, uh, picture there uh, again of the the unity that baptism creates, and that that unity um, is not uh, best demonstrated in uh, secluded baptisms. Maybe not the most charitable way to speak about them, um, but separated baptisms or, or isolation baptisms. Hmm. We got some baptisms that we need to do. We should do some isolation baptisms these days. 
Anyway, so what is said in these verses about the unity of the body of Christ? It is a reality. It's something that we look forward to. Review the service of holy baptism on pages 268, 271 of the Lutheran service book. How is our Christian unity expressed in the baptismal ceremony? Um, I don't have a hymnal with an arm's length of me, but one of my uh, favorite questions in there, and sometimes we do it differently. I think the Lutheran worship was very explicit, the, the blue hymnals, if you will, um, said that uh, an elder was to read a portion. Uh, we welcome you into the Lord's family. We receive you as a fellow member of the body of Christ. Uh, I can't remember what it goes on to say, um, but but that, that part came into the, the service there. Uh, but also, one of the things that we do, we talked about it last time, is, is the questions that we um, ask. Um, sponsors are specifically instructed to speak, but I always invite the whole congregation to answer on behalf and along with especially an infant when they're unable to speak those questions about baptism, reminding us that it is our, our, our same Christian faith that, that they are being baptized into. The next question, uh, what is the relationship between baptism and faith? This is a, a good question for us to consider here. So in baptism, God gives us his word, the word that bestows the benefits of Christ's death and resurrection. The promises of God's word seek faith, and faith is the means by which we receive and embrace God's promises. So Lutheran confessions say, faith is the desire for and the reception of the promise of Christ. The activity of believing or trusting, however, is not in and of itself the cause of our salvation. Everything depends on the word and the commandment of God. For my faith does not make baptism, rather my faith receives baptism. So uh, we, we say that baptism gives faith at time. Um, and, and by that, I think we mean that uh, baptism gives the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is the one who creates faith in us. Um, so it might seem like a circular reasoning, but this is, this is the truth of God's gift for us, that in baptism we receive uh, the power of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit sustains us in our faith. Let's see what the scriptures <clears throat> say about that. Romans chapter 3, verse 23 and following. Romans... Romans 3, verse 23 through 25 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that we he might be just and the justifier as the one of the one who has faith in Jesus. So uh, God is the one who does the work. The illustration that I, I've found helpful and I've shared, I might have shared it more than once, I was wondering about that earlier, but is the idea of in baptism God, um, he, he, he makes a, a deposit or, or writes a check, has this, this guarantee for us and it's um, now something for us to hold on to and to treasure and if we uh, deny this gift or if we say we don't need this gift it doesn't change the reality of the gift but that that gift is given there um, and, and thanks be to God he also along with that gift gives us the power to believe in that gift um, but that power to believe in that gift is sustained by the word itself so so parents are cautioned when they bring their child to baptism that this is not a once and done thing but that faith needs to be nurtured because everything else in the world will tell them that they're okay uh, but the eternal word of God shows us that eternity is secured by God's eternal gifts. And so we want to be about hearing those things um, and living in those things. Galatians chapter 3, Acts, Romans, First and Second Corinthians. Galatians chapter 3 verse 2 says, um, says, Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? And so, again, faith comes by hearing, hearing through the word of Christ, uh, as it said um, in uh, Corinthians. Uh, but, but Galatians 3, verse 2, uh, did you receive the Spirit by works of the law? No, we, we can't work the Spirit into our lives. Uh, we don't uh, clean up our act enough for the Holy Spirit to enter in, but we receive him um, in the places where God has promised to give us his Spirit, and that's, that's through his word, it's through the washing of rebirth and renewal with the Holy Spirit. It's through the Lord's Supper. That's, that's where we receive um, these 
these gifts of God, um, and faith um, comes from hearing that. Uh, Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9, uh, For we have been saved by grace through faith, um, uh, not... For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one can boast. So this this is, and, and the reason this question is helpful is because sometimes uh, people think that faith must come before baptism. Uh, faith lays hold of the gifts that are given in baptism, so that you can't separate them, but you don't want to... Um, put the cart before the horse. Faith can come before baptism, which happens many times, especially for uh, adult converts who, who've confessed their belief in their Savior and then they desire to be baptized um, as is appropriate to, to receive baptism. Um, but, but faith is, is not um, separate from baptism. And in baptism, um, we, we believe God is able to work what he promises in baptism, even if someone is, is unable to confess their faith uh, but we don't just baptize into uh, the oblivion because that faith is sustained by the word. I hope that's clear. I hope that helps. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's, it deserves more discussion, but we're going to move on for the sake of uh, getting to the rest of these. So how, and when and how does baptism create faith? John chapter 3, verse 5 through 8. This is um, just a little bit more on this topic. Uh, John chapter 3, verse 5 through 8 says... Um, Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear it sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. So the Augsburg Confession notes that the Holy Spirit creates faith when and where it pleases God and those who hear the gospel. So faith comes by hearing, um, but where it pleases God. That includes baptism, where God has connected his word to water. God does not force a person to believe, and he does not leave it to our decision, because our will is bound by sin. So we're never going to make that decision to believe in God apart from the gift of the Holy Spirit. So, so that, that might seem, we're never going to decide to believe in God apart from the gift of the Holy Spirit. So, so uh, by, by grace you have been saved. This is not your own doing. This is a gift from God. So whenever somebody believes, we thank God for that belief. All right, I hope that's, hope that's helpful. Although God does not force human beings in such a way that they must become godly believers, nonetheless, God the Lord draws those people whom he wants to convert and does so in such a way that enlightened understanding is fashioned out of darkened understanding and obedient will is fashioned out of a rebellious will. Scripture calls this, creating a new heart. So that quote is from the Augs the formula of Concord, solid declaration. So what's, um, when and how does baptism create faith? It's where God works. And um, so it, th this might seem like God is withholding grace from people, but the way we understand it from scripture is that whenever faith is created, we give God the credit. Whenever faith is not there, so somebody hears a word, it's the sinful condition that's denying the action of God. So we don't ever accuse God of not uh, saving people. And, and that might seem like it's kind of uh, unreasonable. Um, but one of the things about faith is, is that it's not based on reason. It's based on the way God's revealed himself. Um, and we thank God for that faith when, when it shows up and when it's active in the life of a believer. And we trust that God is good and gracious and will work according to his will and desires all people to be saved. And uh, we rest in those promises. We don't let Satan taunt us with those uh, doubts that come our way. We continue to fall back onto God's word and rejoice and continue proclaiming that word and believe that the word will re not return void, but it will accomplish that which for which it was sent, and that is to save uh, the world. All right. Next question, why does an adult need to be baptized if he or she is already a believer? I, I breathe through my teeth because I hope this comes across clearly. Um, I, why does an adult need to be baptized if he or she is already a believer? A person who asks this question likely needs to be gently helped to see that this is the wrong question to ask. Baptism is not something that we have to do. Rather, our our Lord is rich and generous in his gifts. He gives us his promises in the spoken word. So preaching and absolution, the telling people that Jesus died to take away your sins, the Spirit works through those words. That's awesome. Um, but he also works in visible, in the visible and tangible word, baptism and the Lord's Supper. 
and in the written word, so the, the words of Scripture. So you could literally hand somebody the, the New Testament and or, or the Bible, uh, Old and New Testament, and they could read it, and the Holy Spirit could work through that word. This is cool. Means of grace. That's what that um, is. Uh, so we, we have all of these avenues by which the Lord works faith in believers, in, in, in unbelievers to make them believers, works new hearts. So these things should be rejoiced in. Um, so therefore, going on in this answer here, therefore we baptize on the basis of Christ's command and promise. Baptism's promises are rich. Not only are our sins forgiven, but we receive the Holy Spirit and we are made members of his body, the church. So things happen in baptism. Um, things that also happen through the, the hearing of, and the preaching of the word, but promises uh, are explicitly tied to baptism, so we want to make sure that we're taking advantage of those. Um, it was asked last week um, in our lesson, isn't baptism uh, an act of obedience? Yes, it is, but it's not us that makes it happen. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's like saying, hey, go get some food, um, and uh, parents often have to force their children to do that, trust me, um, but it's, it's not... Uh, the children aren't making the food happen. They aren't making the food nourish themselves. Uh, they're, they're obeying the parent by going to the table. So too, we obey the Lord by going to the font where he gives us what we need there. Um, and that's that's something to rejoice in. First Peter 1, verse 3 through 5, I want to go there. Uh, we'll skip the Acts. We've, we've done the Acts passage a number of times, and it's, it's worth your time. Uh, but I'm going to plow forward here. So First Peter 1, verse 3, Blessed be God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So God's work is for you. It's done for you. He is the doer. What rich gifts do you receive? An inheritance that's unperishable, unspared, un fading, unspoiled in heaven, kept in eternity for you. All right, next question here. When can or should adult converts be baptized? Those who are able to receive instruction are normally baptized after being taught the main articles of the Christian faith. However, we must not turn faith into an intellectual achievement with baptism as its reward. So it's not like the graduation ceremony of a confirmation class for adults. God's promises seeks faith, and faith in turn desires and receives God's promises. God's promises spoken to an individual may create faith. Faith, in turn, embraces a promise wherever it's offered and given, including in baptism. Therefore, it may be appropriate, in response to the individual's request for immediate baptism, to baptize an adult who has only recently come to faith. So, bottom line here is there's no hard and fast answer. Some churches do tie a specific timeline to the practice, uh, but, but basically the answer here is helping us see that that it, it might be, um, and, and this is where pastors come in, pastoral discretion uh, can be used in guiding somebody to the waters of baptism. That said, there is that um, the, the gift of baptism is, is uh, held by all believers, so an emergency baptism might be done in certain situations for someone who's recently come to faith. Um, the story of the Ethiopian eunuch is, is very powerful here. He, they're by water, and uh, after the scroll of Isaiah's been read to him, he says, what's preventing me from being baptized? Um, and so immediately he goes and is baptized. Uh, that's, that's a great example of that uh, request for immediate baptism. Why do we normally instruct adults more fully before baptizing them? This is a, a, the good rubber hits the road question, as opposed to an infant who receives no instruction before baptism mentioned a couple times before this though the parents are instructed before that baptism because we want to make sure the parents are intending to raise this child to understand the gifts that are given in baptism not just thinking it's a magical ceremony this mystical event that um, anyway so why do we instruct adults our Lord combines baptism and teaching as he explains how we are to make disciples we should never separate what he joins together the teaching of new adult converts should not be viewed as primary and primarily an intellectual process but instead as one in which baptismal faith and life are summarized for the newly converted by explaining the Ten Commandments, the Apostles' Creed, the Lord's Prayer, the small catechism, um, baptism, absolution, and Lord's Supper. So Acts chapter 20, let's go to this one. Acts comes before Romans. Acts chapter 20 comes after 19 before 21. Acts chapter 20, verse 17 through 27. Now from Miletus he went to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. And when they came to him, he said to them, You yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time 
from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears through the trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance towards God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now behold, I am going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Holy Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not account my life of any value or precious to myself, if only I may finish my course in the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that none of that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all of you, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. So uh, the whole counsel of God, um, the grace of God, uh, the gospel of the grace of God, the um, uh, teaching in public, uh, testifying the repentance toward God and of our faith towards God, of uh, anything that was profitable. So, so Paul was teaching about instructing the believers in Ephesus about everything of God's word and, and summarizing God's word for them. And we see uh, many instances of baptism that took place. And of course, we see the uh, follow-up letter to the church in Ephesus that Paul wrote at a later date that, that shows that faith was flourishing in that place. Uh, and so there we go. So why do we instruct, uh, why do we, when or should adult converts be baptized? Um, there should be an awareness of what they're being baptized into uh, because we want to make sure they're, they're aware of the gifts that God is giving in baptism um, and um, not just uh, being coerced into something that, that um, is effective. But if, if you, uh, again, if you're handed a check that um, says $1 million but you don't know how to read, you might throw it away. Does that mean the check wasn't worth a million dollars? No, it just means you didn't understand what was given to you. Um, so we want to make sure people understand what is given to them in baptism, that they treasure it and that they hold on to it. <laughs> and, um, anyways, what are the biblical and theological reasons for baptizing infants? So this is kind of the other side of the coin here. Um, Jesus died and rose to be gracious Lord of infants as well as adults. Through baptism, infants are taken out of their previous life as sinners, um, as outsiders, and brought under Jesus' protection and ble blessing. Um, infants have great need of such rescue. I'm actually going to go to the small catechism for this answer here because that's the place I like to go. Um, it's probably going to cover all the things here in it, but this is uh, we cover this in confirmation class, and I, I like the uh, summary that is given here. So this is the uh, 2017 edition of the small catechism. Now that might make you think that we rewrote the catechism in 2017, but it's Martin Luther's original um, 1520 whatever catechism um, with an explanation that has, um, so this is Luther's original small catechism. It's 20-ish so pages at the front here. And this is all explanation. So these are further questions for us such as question 303 here, why should babies also be baptized? So this is an explanation that was updated in 2017 and addresses a lot of current modern social uh, affairs and cultural issues that weren't around in 1991, which was when the previous explanation was done. Anyways, I digress. So why should babies be baptized? A. Babies are included in the words all nations. So babies are people too, is how I like to summarize that one. So in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, uh, Jesus says, Go therefore make disciples of all nations, as long as they're old enough. That's not what he said. He, make, he said make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. So babies can be bap disciples through baptize, baptism and instruction. Um, so Acts 2, verse 38 through 39 says, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children. So Acts chapter 2, verse 39 says there, says the promise of baptism, the reception of the Holy Spirit that's found in baptism is for you and for your children. For all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And then we've gone through in, in previous weeks some examples of households being baptized. Again, we don't explicitly hear that there were children in those households, but we do um, uh, 
can assume that there were uh, people of varying ages in those households. All right, so that's A, people, uh, babies are people too. Uh, that, that is, babies are part of the all nations command. Um, part B of the answer here, why should we baptize babies? Babies are sinful. That might be hard for us to wrap our heads around because they're so sweet and they're so innocent and so cute. And can they, can they really be sinful if they're not deciding to sin? Here's the thing. It's kind of morbid in, in reality, uh, uh, but, but babies die. And um, death is a sign of sin and, um, and a, a need for rescue. Um, and so if, if, if babies didn't die... You know, we might have a really good argument for the age of accountability. That's that's the uh, the counter argument against baptizing infants. Um, but but the fact that infants and, and children die um, is a sign that they are, there is sin a sin situation that they are um, in. Now that doesn't mean they die for their sin, but because of sin, death is in the world. Um, Psalm fifty one verse five, David uh, writes, "Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me." Uh, Romans 5 verse 12, just as sin came into the world through one man and, uh, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all men sinned. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification in life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. So there we see um, sin uh, brings death, death is a sign of sin. Um, but thanks be to God, we have the life in Christ that's given to us as well. So babies are sinful, and they need what baptism promises, the forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit, which gives us life. All right, and the part C, um, uh, the Holy Spirit is able to work faith in babies. So that might be strange, because how can a baby have faith? Um, Psalm 9, 22, verse 9 and 10, Psalm 22, verse 9 and 10, very beautiful words. It says, yet you are he who took me from the womb, you made me trust you at my mother's breasts. On you I was cast from my birth, and from my mother's womb you have been my God. Uh, Psalm 71, so that was Psalm 22, verse 9 and 10. Psalm 71, verse 5 and 6 says, For you, O Lord, are my hope, my trust, O Lord, from my youth. Upon you I have learned from before, excuse me, upon you have I leaned from before my birth. You are he who took me from my mother's womb. My praise is continually of you. And then Matthew chapter 18, whoever causes one of these little ones to sin, who believe in me to sin, it is better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. So we're answering here, we're seeing examples of scripture where um, infants, uh, youth, young children can have faith. Uh, it, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, um, and then Matthew 21, verse 16, Jesus said to them, Yes, you have never read out of the mouths of infants and nursing babies. You have prepared praise. Uh, praise is a result of faith anyways. So yes, the Holy Spirit is able to work faith. Um, there's a great summary at the bottom of page 289 in this. that says, Faith is not to be confused with intellectual ability. This is a problem that we often um, find ourselves falling into. I won't say we run into it in the church because I'm perfectly uh, uh, clear of this. Uh, but faith is not the same as intellectual assent. Those who argue for believer's baptism, that is an age of accountability, um, and, and th so those who reject the baptism of infants, um, or those with severe cognitive disabilities, that's, that's something that um, would go hand in hand. If, if babies aren't to be baptized, then also those um, who can't um, cognitively function on a certain level should not be baptized either. Uh, that, that wrongly maintains, one, that baptisms, uh, infants, I'm sorry, that wrongly maintains that infants are not guilty of sin or accountable for sin or able to commit sinful acts. And um, as a parent, I, I can tell you that, you know, you might give them a little bit of a, a leeway for, for a couple months, but as pretty soon, babies, you can start to see that infants are, are, they're doing the wrong thing, even when they know they're not supposed to. And it almost seems like they want to do the wrong thing or they're inclined to do the wrong thing. Hmm. It's almost as if uh, scripture should have said something about that. That is our, where our hearts are directed uh, uh, from birth, that, that life according to the flesh is inclined towards sin. Um, so, so those who deny uh, baptism for infants or those with cognitive disabilities um, are wrongly maintaining that faith is a human decision that infants cannot make. And they're wrongly maintaining that baptism is primarily our promise to God rather than God's promise to us. 
Not one of these views is based on scripture. So the view that infants are not guilty of or accountable for sin or able to commit sinful acts, that view is counter to scripture. The idea that faith is merely a human decision, um, that infants cannot make such a de decision or those with cognitive impairments cannot make such a human decision, uh, that is not in scripture. Faith is not a human decision. Baptism or the idea that baptism is primarily our promise to God rather than God's promise to us, that is not based in scripture. Um, so to summarize that, parents should not deny baptism to their children any more than they should deny them other vital needs. The necessity of baptism, however, does not mean that children who are stillborn or die before they're brought to baptism are lost. That's something that we want to hear as well. Um, we commend such children to the gracious care of their maker and their redeemer, trusting his mercy and love even when we do not understand his will or his work. So that um, I'm skipping over. You can read through these passages as well. We covered some of them in our, our, our answer there as found in the Lord's, uh, in, the, in the Luther's small catechism. Uh, Luther also writes, baptism does not become invalid if it's not properly received or used. As I've said, for it's not bound to our faith, but to the word. Oh, wow, there's lots of other thoughts going on here. But lots can be said about this. And the thing that we want to do is when we're answering these questions, it might make sense to us to go to our reason and our senses, but where do we go first? We go first to the Word of God, and that's what um, the Catechism's explanation does there for us, helping us see that baptism is a gift from God. Faith is a gift from God. Faith is not intellectual assent. Faith is, is belief uh, worked by the Holy Spirit and given by God um, through the power of His Word. Um, so that covered question eight here as well. Are infants or people who have mental or emotional limitations capable of believing the promises of baptism? I commend that to you. If you haven't downloaded the study guide yourself, uh, you can find this if you search for LCMSCTCR baptism. It'll bring you to a web page uh, that, that has this document in it. And also another one, the report from the LCMSCTCR on baptism will give you a little bit more words than just the questions and some of the paragraphs here. Um, we also help, took question nine here. What if a baby or Christian parents uh, of Christian parents dies before it's baptized? Great, great, great question. Uh, taking a little more at length than I did with the paragraph from the small catechism. But I do want to spend time scrolling back up here um, and, and go through this conclusion, reminding us about Jesus' baptismal promise to us. Baptism brings us under the reign of Christ, this transition into God's kingdom is often described in the New Testament in dramatic terms of new birth, death, and rescue, death and resurrection, rescue from the devil. In the kingdom, we are brought under the care and the protection of God. So John 3, verse 3, we're going to go there first here. Do, 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 Matthew, Mark, Luke, John 3, verse 3. All right. Uh, Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Sorry, that was coffee, and it's cold because I've been going too long between my sips. Unless one is born again, he cannot enter, cannot see the kingdom of God. So Jesus speaking to Nicodemus, Nick at night, in the John chapter 3, uh, discussion with Nicodemus here. How is the transition into God's kingdom described in this verse? Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. All right? Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Romans 6 verse 4 and 6 verse 11. I'm going to guess they're on the same page. They are. Almost. Verse 4 starts on the other page. All right, Romans 6 verse 4 says, We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Love that verse. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. So um, John 3 verse 3 said, uh, Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Um, Romans 6 tells us that through baptism, we are buried into Christ's death and raised again to his new life. So you also must consider yourselves to de dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Sounds like new birth talk there, doesn't it? Uh, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9 through 11. 
uh, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9 through 11 says, And such were some of you, that is, bad uh, people of darkness, unrighteous. Um, so 6, verse uh, 9 through 11. Okay. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9 through 11 says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, the idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. You must be born again to see the kingdom of God, to inherit the kingdom of God. So verse 11, 1 Corinthians says, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 11 says, And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Last place we're going to go, Colossians chapter 1, verse 13 through 14 says, um, He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. How does the transition into God's kingdom described in this verse is new birth, uh, death to life, uh, once you were in darkness, but now you've been, uh, such you were, but now you are in the kingdom of his beloved son, uh, in whom we have the redemption and forgiveness of sins. So this, the life of a baptized Christian is not an easy life, at least not this side of heaven. Uh, so we are in the kingdom of God through the baptism, but as part of the kingdom of God, just real quickly, uh, uh, the kingdom of God, another way to think of it, to understand what's going on is, is that it's the reign of God. Um, so whenever we hear this kingdom word, we, we sometimes, I shouldn't say whenever, but sometimes we start to think of a geographic or a political principality. But the reign of God is wherever the forgiveness of sins is found. So it's not tied up for any geographic specific location. It's not political entities. It's not some orientation. It is wherever the forgiveness of sins is found. And so that is what the kingdom of God is. The reign of God is there. So as we live in the forgiveness of God, we are part of the kingdom of God. Um, that is what baptism gives us. That's what faith gives us. That's what laying hold of these promises, the forgiveness gives to us. So we have this life with God. So what does this life look like? The life of a baptized Christian is not an easy life, at least not this side of heaven. God does not promise that we will prosper financially or that we will always be healthy or that our relationships will work out as they intend. Uh, Christians, like their non-Christian neighbors, live in a broken world, a world infected by sin. So that's the reality, um, the curse that's placed upon us. Let's let's just review that real quick so so we can see. And, and part of the, the curse is, I mean, um, understanding what happened when the world fell into sin is helpful. Uh, verse 16 of Genesis chapter 3, To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth your children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Um, one translation of that that I like is, is that you shall try to, you want to be like your husband, um, and he will rule over you. And this, again, is a curse. Uh, this is a, an effect of sin that, that anyways, uh, we can uh, digress a lot on that. But Adam, he said, because you've listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat of the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, and uh, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. So what do these verses say about the present creation, about the new heavens and the new earth that's to come? The present creation that we're in is uh, one way to summarize what's happening here in Genesis 3. Things are not good. <laughs> Very basic, Pastor. Uh, things are not as they should be, though, I think is, is what we want to real realize. Um, and Romans 8, verse 20 through 23, all creation is groaning, I think, is what's going on there. Um, Acts, Romans, uh, comes before the Corinthians. So Romans 8, verse 20 through 23 uh, says for creation was subjected to futility not willingly but because of him who subjected it in hope that creation itself would be set free from its bondage to corruption and would obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God for we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now and not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we await the adoption of sons, the redemption of our bodies. 
so we're looking forward to more. Um, even though we have this deposit, this inheritance, this treasure given to us in baptism, things are still, excuse me, sucky. Uh, things are not as they should be. Second Peter 3, let's go there. These passages are helpful for us to realize. These are a diagnosis, a, a, a reality check for us that the world is not as it should be. Second uh, Peter 3, verse 11 says, Since all these things are thus to be destroyed, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? What sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn? But according to his promise, we are waiting for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Kind of frightening hearing about that burning, but we have uh, something, we have a, uh, what do you call it, a fire insurance, prote <laughs> uh, the baptism is our, our fire protection plan that God has given us. We, we will be delivered uh, and as we are found in Christ, thanks be to God. Uh, we look forward to a new heavens and a new earth that are to be revealed, and Revelation gives us a glimpse of those, Revelation 21, first two books of the Bible, first two chapters of the Bible, Genesis 1 and 2. Last two chapters of the Bible, Gen uh, Revelation 21, 22, uh, the only two places you see sinless existences, um, great places to give us glimpses of what God intends to give us in the future. Uh, so Revelation 21, verse 1 through 8 says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them. They will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death shall be no more, neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. One of the things that I think is great about, uh, I've heard it said, and I, it's just cool to, to meditate on, is heaven is so... Um, glorious unimaginable that um it's described not in what it is but in what it's not because we can't even begin to comprehend the goodness that it is I, and so I don't, I don't know if that makes sense but notice it says he will wipe away every tear from their eyes death shall be no more neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away we hear more about what will not be in eternity than what um is because it's so beyond our, anyways, uh, verse five, and he who was seated on the throne said, behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it is done. I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end to the thirsty. I will give from the spring of water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage. I will be his God and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, the sorcerers, the idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur. This is the second death. Um, what do these verses say about the present creation, about the new heavens and the new earth to come? This, what we're in now, not cool. What's coming, we're looking forward to. Um, so, and, and we, we realize that the things that we're in right now are not always, uh, what do you call it, gravy and uh, grapes. It's more like gravestones and, and gripes. Ugh, boy. So at times our lives were filled with success and joy and hope as we reap the benefits of living in God's creation, which he blesses and for which he still graciously cares. So we do get uh, God's benefits here on this earth, our daily bread, so to speak, the, the good gifts of his first article created the heavens and the earth for us. Um, we have this blessing and these benefits to look forward to and to rejoice in. But we, we look forward even more to that which is to come. So let's look how uh, God continues to care for the world he created. Psalm 104, um, verses 10 through 23. I'm going to have to speed up just a little bit here because um, real world time, you're going to see me in uh, Sunday morning worship in about 20 minutes here. Uh, so uh, Psalm 104, uh, verse 10 says, You make the springs gush forth. In the valleys, they flow between the hills. They give drink to the beast of every hill, uh, to the beast of every field. The wild donkeys quench their thirst. Besides them, the birds of heaven dwell. They swing, sing among, among the branches. From your lofty abode, you water the mountains. The earth is satisfied 
the fruit of your work. It goes on uh, talking, God is in control of his creation. Matthew 5, verse 45, uh, one of my favorite passages, uh, uh, consider the birds. Uh, 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 it says, uh, Matthew 5, verse 45, oh, that's in Matthew chapter 6. Yeah, we'll get there. Matthew 5, verse 45, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven, uh, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. For he makes the sun to rise on the evil and on the good. He sends rain on the just and the unjust. How does God care for his creation? He does. He keeps his world going for the sake of people in it. Um, and and uh, putting it all together, he, he holds things together so that we might get the most important thing, life for him. That life comes through the word. So he's sustaining creation so that all may hear, so that many may hear, so that all may come to know the salvation that he desires for us. Uh, Matthew 6 verse 26 says, um, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Yes, God takes care of you. Acts 14, verse 16 through 17 uh, says, In past generations he allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways. Yet he did not leave himself without witness, for he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. How does God continue to care for the world he created? He just does. It's his first article uh, gift to us, uh, the creation of the world. Um, the fourth petition of the Lord's Prayer reminds us that he gives us our daily bread. Um, he continues to sustain that which he created. He is uh, desiring um, that this creation would work during this time of grace um, until the time of glory is revealed. Um, and that's that's a uh, understanding we haven't really gotten into, but we are in the time of grace right now where God's grace is available. Uh, when his glory is revealed, um, we are fortunately, as recipients of his grace, made glorious, um, but uh, um, we pray that God's wrath would not be revealed against many, but that many would be saved. All right. So at times our lives may be characterized by disappointments, setbacks, and tragedies. We know this. It may be difficult for us to believe that God will keep his promises to us. We want him to give us clear and immediate answers to our questions and good, sensible reasons for his actions or his apparent inaction. We want, to hold, we want God to be accountable to us, don't we? Yes, we do. We may at times be tempted to reject God entirely. God, help us uh, continue to receive from you and not to turn from you. John 14, verse 27 tells us, Jesus tells you, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. John 16, verse 33, just a page over, or two says, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. What does our Lord say about our troubles in this world? You're going to have them, but you have peace in me. Uh, which is bigger, the troubles of this world or the peace we have in Christ? Keep listening because it's the peace we have in Christ. And I say keep listening because we need to keep hearing that because the troubles of the world will try to tell us everything um, is bigger than God, but God is bigger than the boogeyman. Um, and we have peace in Christ that surpasses all understanding and, and all tragedies that come our way. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verses 4 through 8, tells us, For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened. Not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by light, by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are um, home or away, we make it our aim to please him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so each may receive what is due for what he's done in the body, whether good or evil. And thanks be to God, what we've done in the body is what Christ does through us as we have faith in him. I went on a couple extra verses, so I had to bring that around. Why can we have courage in the face of worldly troubles? Uh, because we walk by faith, not by sight. That which we see is not the, the last word. We have the eternity of God promised to us. First Peter verses five, first Peter five verses six through seven. Always a hard book to find because it's so small. 
1 Peter 5, verse 6 through 7 says to us, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Why can we have courage in the face of worldly troubles? God is not unconcerned or unfamiliar with our anxieties or our weaknesses, and he desires that in the midst of them we would turn to him and, and know that he is sustaining us through them for the best which is yet to come. So baptized and believing Christians live by faith in Christ's promises and not by the proof of our eyes. We trust Christ to keep his promises no matter what we see, feel, or experience. Christian life is a journey of living out that venture of faith day by day. One who lives by faith can live without having every question answered or every puzzle in life resolved. That's sometimes hard for um, people to, to live in, but, but that's the reality of living by faith. We don't have all the explanations and all the reasons, but we do get the proclamation, the truth that is in God's word for us. Such God-given baptismal faith enables us to navigate the tragedies of life and not be crushed by the unexpected events of life or threats to our faith that inevitably come our way. When we fall by failing to trust God, we repent by renouncing our desire for control and embracing God's baptismal promises again. When tragedies occur, we lament, as God's people have always done. We don't say, ah, this is okay. We say, this sucks. God, deliver us from evil. And we take our complaints to him. God, how long, O oh Lord, must this last? And, and he hears us. We can live with the circumstances of life, both good and bad, because we live by faith that will be vindicated when we are raised from the dead on the last day. The devil strives with rage and spite against those who are baptized into Christ. For this reason, Luther urged pastors and people to approach baptism with the utmost seriousness. Remember, therefore, it is no joke to take strides against the devil, and not only to drive him away from the little child in baptism, but to burden the child with such a mighty and lifelong enemy. Yet the Christian is able to confess all sins and failures, receive the assurance of God in absolution, and to say with confidence, I am baptized. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. Behold, I am with you always to the very end of the age. That wraps us up on baptism. I, I pray that in these pandemic days this has been a, a, a blessing for you as we consider this treasure which we lay hold on even in the midst of the things going on in the world around us. We have a greater promise. We have a greater future and a hope because of what's given to us, done for us in baptism. Remember, God is the doer in baptism. It's not up to us, uh, but it is up to us to to treasure that and to lay hold of it and to, to continue to, to live in that gift that we have in baptism. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, by Christ living in us, thanks be to God, it happens. All right, hope to see you soon. You guys have a wonderful night in the Lord.